Good afternoon, good evening, everybody. My name is Jason Morrison. I'm the president of the Pacific Institute. Uh, today, I'm going to be uh, serving the role of uh, moderator for this session, I'm not presenting except for the background information uh, itself, but I'll get to that. Um, the Pacific Institute for a, a while now has been doing webinars as a, a vehicle to reach our intended audiences with our research. Um, Many of those are focused on the audience uh, of a particular product that we're releasing. Uh, and some of those are quite uh, technical in nature. Uh, but we thought it, it would be useful to do uh, more webinars that are on topics of general interest and uh, to uh, develop the content or at least speak about the issue in a way that hopefully is not too technical uh, and that will be of interest um, to the lay person that cares about water. And the first uh, one of such uh, webinars is the one today on uh, COVID-19 as it relates to water. Uh, and as you see here, the title, From Risk to Resilience. Um, we hope to do more of these in the future. We'll likely do them on a regular basis, probably uh, bi-monthly or quarterly. Uh, so stay tuned for that. And if you're not already on the Pacific Institute's listserv, I'd encourage you to go to our website and sign up for that listserv because that'll be where we announce webinars as they come. We, um, uh, next slide, why don't we move right into some of the, the housekeeping. Some of you may uh, already know that your microphone has been muted. We're expecting a fairly large group and therefore uh, it seemed uh, unwieldy to have uh, live microphones. So as we're going through this program, if you have questions, you'll see in the lower bar of your screen uh, a Q&A uh, function. And if you uh, click on that, it will expand into a sidebar that you can type in questions. And I will be working with uh, my team to try to process those questions. And we will have a number of opportunities to uh, relay them to our speakers uh, and to have a discussion around uh, the issues that are raised. The, uh, I'm going to go through the uh, agenda shortly, but we're going to do this more or less in two segments. And what we'll do is we'll break for Q&A after the first segment, uh, and then we will uh, go on to the second portion of the um, agenda, and we'll have a longer Q&A that will allow us also the opportunity to pan out a little bit and maybe talk more broadly around uh, COVID-19 and water uh, and uh, the need for uh, resilience. Next slide, please. So uh, I'm going to say a few words about the Pacific Institute for those that are not familiar with the organization. I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, our new strategic direction. I have a few slides on that front. Uh, and then I'm going to turn uh, to my caller, a colleague, Heather, who's going to speak specifically about how COVID-19 has had impacts on cities um, in many more than you might have imagined. And we'll try to talk about the contours uh, of what that looks like. Uh, and then uh, my colleague uh, Morgan is gonna talk about how COVID-19 has had uh, ramifications when it comes to shutoffs and access to water uh, and some of the social uh, equity uh, dimensions of uh, the pandemic as it relates to water. So a few words about the Pacific Institute. Our, uh, we have our 501c3 under uh, US uh, tax law, which means we're a, a public interest organization. Uh, we're about 33 years old now. And our mission uh, is to create and advance solutions to the world's most pressing water challenges. Uh, and when we think of our vision for water, we think of the three dimensions of sustainability, the, the equity piece, social equity, uh, the economy in which communities and societies rely upon, and then the environmental component as well. And when we think about uh, our vision for water sustainability, we're thinking about it now, today, but also for generations to come. Last year, we began a process of uh, identifying what are gonna be the key issues for the Institute as we look to advance uh, 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 water sustainability. Uh, and we've come to a, a, a fundamental shift in the way that we're gonna be thinking about our work. And we set for ourselves uh, a goal uh, to 
play a catalytic role in the transformation uh, toward water resilience in the face of climate change. And um, today's uh, session is gonna focus on how a health pandemic like COVID-19 is creating a shock to water systems. And that's an acute shock and it's here and now. But we've also recognized for a number of years now that climate change is going to present, has already begun to present, and will present many more uh, such shocks on our water systems and our society. And so our ambition over the next year is to help build more resilient water systems and to play a role in catalyzing that transformation uh, in the coming decade. We have three what you might call uh, anchor strategies or meta strategies that we think will hold up for the next decade. One is around raising the profile of water. Right now, we, we think it's not um, front and center for decision makers from every segment of society, uh, and therefore we are not investing in uh, improving water security and resilience. And the way that we get to that, that uh, appropriate level of investment in decision making is to raise the profile. And we're gonna spend uh, quite a bit of time um, uh, advancing a number of strategies that try to do that and build out our own communications and outreach capabilities along those lines. Our change theory is also based on the idea that one of the fastest ways to, to get to change is to work with leaders to innovate and demonstrate what is possible. Uh, and of course, our role in that will be to study uh, those innovations and to, to, to prove their efficacy. Um, but for those that, that show that they have promise uh, and, and empirically demonstrated that they have promise, we will look to scale those. And we think of doing so through two pathways. One is through advocacy and policy and uptake of these ideas in pol policy. And the other will be, because we are a relatively small organization, through institutional partnerships, the types of partnerships where we can reach those decision makers and those water users that actually are on the front lines of managing water and that need to adopt these ideas in order to accelerate the transition. We have three areas that we think are absolutely fundamental in this transition and we are gonna spend much of our programmatic work uh, focusing on these topics. So the first is around vulnerable communities. And uh, we're gonna speak to that issue a little bit today in the sec second segment of our program. But if you, if you pan back out a bit, you can think of, we know climate change generally disproportionately impacts the poor. And when it comes to climate and water, there will be uh, segments of our society that are gonna be much more impacted than others. And, our work in this area is to make sure that we understand and we address and mitigate those impacts for those communities uh, in, the, in the coming years uh, uh, as, as climate change and its impacts become more pronounced. The second is an area around uh, nature-based solutions is the term we're using here. Some will know of it as a green infrastructure solutions. But the idea here is that there's a lot of work that can be done to restore uh, and invest in natural systems as both a resiliency strategies, think natural disaster and storm events, and the ability of our natural systems to absorb those, but also the, the natural benefit of carbon sequestration, healthy ecosystems, healthy soils, not only have water benefits, but also climate mitigation benefits. And we think there's a ton of work to be done in this area and that we will be pursuing. We already are working on it. Uh, and we'll do much more of it in the years to come. And then lastly, uh, an area of work that the Institute has uh, specialized in for uh, since the beginning of our organization around water efficiency uh, and reuse, uh, there's still lots more work to be done to uh, optimize and scale reuse strategies uh, and to really um, mainstream uh, leading practice when it comes to efficiency. Uh, and as water becomes more stressed around the world, uh, the economic uh, imperative or the, the value proposition for doing that uh, and, and uh, adopting more water efficient uh, uh, practices will become clearer and clearer with each passing year. So that's a little bit of background uh, on the Institute and, uh, and where we are heading uh, in the coming year. Uh, and let's now uh, pivot a little bit. Um, if you wanna see 
the full uh, uh, biographies of our next two speakers, uh, you can do so on our website. Uh, they are listed um, uh, there. Um, um, but I'm just going to do a very cursory introduction. Our first speaker will be Heather Cooley, who is the Director of Research at the Institute. Uh, and she's going to talk about uh, the impact of COVID-19 on cities uh, and on municipal water demand specifically. Uh, and then the second seg segment will be Morgan Shimabuku, who will talk about some of the social uh, equity dimensions uh, of COVID-19 and water. So with that, uh, Heather, over to you. And you're muted now, um, but I'm sure you're aware of that. Yes, thanks. Thank you, Jason. And thanks for that reminder. <laughs> um, so uh, thank you all for, for joining us today. Um, as Jason mentioned, I'm gonna focus a bit on the impacts on municipal water use. Um, and you know, before I dive into that, I, I really wanna kind of talk about what I think are sort of the key takeaways um, of what we're gonna talk about today. Um, you know, as Jason mentioned, uh, COVID-19 has, has identified and highlighted some of the perennial water management deficiencies. It's also helped to identify new deficiencies. Um, and, you know, given that uh, we know that extreme events from severe floods and droughts due to climate change, but also social disruptions like COVID-19 are becoming more common, um, we know that we can take lessons from COVID-19, from its impact responses and where those vulnerabilities and deficiencies are to try to build resilience that we can learn fr from what we're experiencing now. Um, and, and based on that, and, and because of this sort of more variable and uncertain future, you know, we know that there's an immediate and sustained action is, is really needed to enhance resilience. Um, and that's, I think, one of the themes you, you will see in what we're going to present. Um, and also the theme of, of our organization as we're, we're looking to, to advance resilience. Apologize for that. Um, in addition, I, you know, one of our key takeaways is that um, water access affordability and equity must be explicitly addressed in resilience efforts. You know, this is one of those issues that's an ongoing deficiency, um, its importance in relation to COVID-19, I think has become um, even clearer uh, and, and um, you know, must be something we address. I apologize, the, um, the screen is uh, misbehaving. Morgan, do you mind if I give you um, control and you can advance these? I think you may have a, an easier option, uh, potential to do that. Sure, sounds good. And if you can then just go back one slide, that would be great. So one of the um, areas that we have looked at uh, in particular um, as it relates to COVID-19 is the critical impacts on uh, municipal water use. Um, we've, we did an early assessment on this using some of the available data. And what we found is that household water demand has increased in response to the pandemic. Um, that's probably not surprising to, to many of you um, because of the uh, shelter in place and business shutdowns, more people are, are at home uh, and they're using water uh, there um, and, and shifting some of that use that they would normally be doing in, in the workplace. So household demand has gone up. Um, we've also seen that non-household uses, so commercial, industrial, even institutional uses, have declined. Um, in some cases, those, those reductions have been pretty dramatic. Uh, it really depends from industry to industry, but some communities have seen reductions in their non-household demand as high as 35%, so, so very significant. Um, the net effect of that really varies from community to community, but in general, what it has done is reduced water demand. Um, some of more residential communities have seen their demand go up, but, but typically with the mixed use, you know, those that have both residential and some non-residential uses have seen their demand drop. Um, these changes are, are likely temporary, uh, right? They'll, they'll be uh, seen as we are at home, as the businesses are shut down, 
Um, some, though, may last longer. So if unemployment remains high, we could see a lot larger and longer term impact on demand. Um, if businesses continue to be shut down, uh, or if there are sort of more dramatic and, and changes to our economy, we could see an actual longer term impact. Although we expect that, that what we've seen right now, it will be short term, will be over the course of several months. The uh, next slide, please. The, the changes in demand, these very sudden changes in demand can have a ripple effect. Um, they can affect building operations and, and water quality. So, uh, you know, the, the water for, for these businesses that have shut down, now water is stagnant in, in these pipes. Um, typically, a water quality is maintained. There's always a steady flow of that water in the building. As they're shut down, the water is stagnant. Um, that can then lead to issues around mold or bacteria, um, like Legionella, which, which, is, which is incredibly problematic. Um, it can lead to a corrosion from pipes as well. Uh, and so this is, you know, an issue we need to be aware of. It's an issue we certainly can manage. Um, one of the challenges, though, is that many building operators are unaware of this. This is, this is sort of an unprecedented um, for, for many. Uh, and so we need to improve um, understanding and, and advance best practice around how to safely reopen buildings so that we're not looking at, you know, Legionella, Legionnaire's disease um, spikes as buildings start to reopen. Um, the other impact can be broader on the water and wastewater system. So, you know, these systems are operated based on historic demand. Um, and where you have sudden changes, even if the change over the entire, you know, community isn't that large, within the community, there can be pretty significant changes. You can see in the residential area, water use go up quite a bit. In the commercial areas, it drops quite a bit. And so that can create issues and new stresses and strains on the operation of these systems and balancing that, um, again, can be done. It's going to be increasingly complex where you have um, operators that are, you know, are, are working from home, for example, um, who, who are staffing, where staffing is down. And so again, something I think that was an unanticipated impact, one we can manage, but one we need to be thinking about in the future as, as these types of events become more common. Um, the other impact is a financial one, and, and I'll talk a bit more about this in the next slides, uh, but, but it's really an impact both on customer bills, um, but also on utility revenue, and those two can have, can have broader impacts. Um, next slide, please. Uh, in terms of, 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 of water bills, customer water bills, um, because household use is going up, not surprisingly, household water bills are also likely to rise. Um, and the counter is that the non-household bills are likely to fall. Um, as you recall, and as I mentioned previously, total demand has gone down for most communities, and that is equal to a revenue loss. And it's a, a pretty sudden and unexpected revenue loss. Um, that is then compounded by some of the higher costs that utilities are experiencing. They're, they're having to pay hazard, uh, hazard pay, for example. Um, they're having to pay for people working overtime. There are new supplies, new precautions that they need to put in place. That has increased their costs. Um, so that is coming at the same time when revenue's down. And then there's also likely to be an increase in non-payment. Um, we know that unemployment is skyrocketing. People are already struggling to pay bills. And with more people out of work um, and, and household bills being higher, we may see an increase in non-payment. So that's going to put a crunch, uh, an even greater crunch, on some of these utilities. Um, the likely impact of that, uh, there have been a number of surveys that have been done, the likely impact is that we'll see delays in infrastructure investments. Um, now we know that water infrastructure investments are way behind. We are not keeping pace, have not been keeping pace for, for decades. Um, and so this is going to further delay us at, again, at a time when we have issues with climate change and these other types of extreme events um, you know, facing us. Uh, the other point I think it's important to keep in mind is that these small water systems are especially vulnerable to these impacts. Um, they typically have a, a smaller customer base, so fewer people to spread these costs. And so that can be a challenge. 
Um, they also have fewer operators. Uh, and so they're not as able to be flexible or manage uh, some of the issues that I mentioned previously in terms of the water system, trying to manage some of the changes uh, there. So, so there will be, I think, a, an effort and a need to focus in on some of these small systems to ensure that, that they are able to uh, address these kinds of challenges. Uh, next slide. Um, you know, what I think we can take from, from COVID-19, again, um, is the, the opportunity and the need um, to enhance water resilience broadly. Um, and that has a variety of components. Uh, next, please. Um, first is around really developing and implementing robust and sophisticated resilience plans. Um, we really need to move, be moving beyond traditional assumptions about events like uh, these extreme events. Um, and really start to plan uh, and, and think about building robust, resilient systems able to withstand these types of impacts. Next slide, please. Um, another component is around um, adopting uh, digital monitoring and operational technologies. So, you know, one of the issues with COVID-19 is, is really the sudden change in, uh, in, in demand and, and changes around the system. And you know, without digital monitoring uh, technologies, we're, we're not really aware of those. We're not able to get ahead of the curve. Um, we're always sort of behind the, the, the eight ball there. And so increasing uptake of these types of technologies is gonna allow us to react more quickly um, and, and to be more flexible. Uh, and that's gonna be essential um, with resilience. Next, please. Um, the third area is around um, updating pricing and financial policies. Uh, so ensuring that rate structures um, are robust and are able to take some of these swings into account, um, that there are financial policies likewise that are able to do that. Uh, many utilities uh, or can and should have um, cash reserves uh, and ensuring that those are robust, that there's clear policies on how to implement that are going to go a long way to dealing with these sort of unexpected events. Um, and then the issue and opportunities around commercial insurance products as providing sort of another opportunity um, to, to increase their resilience. Um, and finally, um, there really is a need for um, stimulus funds um, to help maintain the infrastructure investments that we're likely to see fall off, um, but also as a mechanism for stimulating um, economic recovery. Uh, there, there's a real need, as I mentioned previously, for infrastructure investments, and this is a, a great opportunity um, to be setting us up for success in the future while also helping to stimulate the economy. Um, so I will take a, sh a short break there um, and see if there are any questions. I think, Jason, you're going to moderate those. I will try, and I will encourage um, folks to uh, type in any questions that they have uh, in the Q&A function. Uh, we did get a, a comment already that was saying that uh, there is work already underway to build resilience in, in the water sector here in the U.S., uh, led by the work that... Uh, EPA is doing. I know uh, the World Bank has also been leading on this. I know there's some representatives on the World Bank uh, on this webinar right now and uh, may wish also to weigh in with uh, resources you'd like to call our attention to. Um, but maybe if I could uh, provide the first question as people are writing their questions uh, in that Q&A function. So Heather, what do you, uh, what, there's clearly um, interest now and the recognition that there's a need to build uh, toward this resilience uh, uh, mindset. Um, would, you, uh, uh, would you be able to identify what you think some of the key um, uh, barriers uh, to accelerating this, uh, this work and the, these, um, uh, these, this progress and this shift over? I mean, at high level, what do you think are some of the bigger um, uh, uh, blocks because the intention seems to be there. Um, and so I'm just interested in what you think is holding things back. Yeah, so I do think um, COVID-19 has helped to accelerate that. I think there were many that are, have been aware of these issues. The idea of climate change and impacts on water is not a new one. Um, but I think there has been some uncertainty about what do we do about it? Um, what are the types of things we need to put in place to help build resilience? And so there have been um, some utilities really cutting edge, I would say, and trying to advance this. You typically see it in the larger utilities 
um, who have the tool, you know, the resources, the staff that are able to dedicate to that. Um, you, you're not seeing it as much in the small and medium. Although, as you know, there are efforts by EPA and others to try to help build resilience. Um, but, but so I think there's a knowledge gap there in terms of what do we do, um, but there's also funding gaps as well. Um, we know that we underinvest in water. Um, it's an undervalued resource. And so, uh, you know, you're not seeing the types of investments um, that we need in order to, to move things forward. Great. So we do have a, a number of questions coming in. I'm going to um, uh, just try to go in sequence uh, and maybe look to bundle uh, if there are like questions. The first one is around um, small and medium-sized systems, rural areas, et, et cetera, and how, wh where they can find information on this transition to digital monitoring and operational technologies. Uh, obviously, some of these uh, are more expensive, and so already uh, these smaller systems are in a situation where uh, yeah, they're not uh, well endowed uh, with financial resources. So are there um, uh, uh, information and or uh, tools that they can utilize as they're looking uh, to this digital monitoring and operational technologies piece? There are, although I think that's a, a great one of the, I think, challenges with the small systems is not, and the medium size is not having the resources that these larger ones. And so I do think there can be a role, frankly, for some of the larger utilities to um, be trying them out, uh, you know, doing piloting and then looking at scaling the, the successful ones. Um, there are, though, some groups that are focused in particular on small and, and medium size uh, utilities, um, some both in the nonprofit, but also in, in government as well. EPA is obviously one of those. Um, there's the um, Rural Community Assistance uh, Partnership, who's focused on some of the small systems. Um, uh, and so there, there are, I, I think, uh, programs available. Uh, but that I think is one one area where where there really needs to be an emphasis um, because they are at the greatest risk. Great. And then we have a question I'm going to take a little bit out of sequence, but it's related to this as well, which is, uh, are there data that uh, demonstrate that those uh, utilities that have shifted over to more digital systems for monitoring and operation uh, have had more success in dealing with the, the shocks associated with COVID-19? Any well, empirical data out there? Yeah. So, um, there, ha there haven't been data on performance in terms of have they weathered this better or not. Um, I think it's a little, still a little too early to tell, but I was able, it was funny when we were pulling some of this together and in, 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 uh, there's an issue brief here where that gets into this issue far more. Um, it was much, you know, those utilities that had that, that had um, sort of AMI systems, advanced metering infrastructure, were very quickly able to respond and to provide that information. Many of the other ones, you know, it's a month they're reading meters, sometimes every two months they're reading meters. And so they don't have a sense of what's happening. They may have a sense in their system, but they don't have a sense of what's happening at the customer side um, until several months after the fact. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so in terms of the data that was available, those who had AMI had much more data readily available, um, and then we're managing to that. Great. So another couple of questions that are focusing on some of the financial dimensions of this. And the question is around, can you maybe order a magnitude, help us understand what we're expecting or projecting in terms of the drop in investments in infrastructure? But I'm also, and I suspect that will be place dependent, location by location, but any general remarks you might have about that. But I'd also be interested, you talked about revenue hits uh, and just order of magnitude, what are we talking about here in terms of how big these revenue hits have been uh, as a result? So either both on the operations side, but also on the infrastructure investment side, anything you could share with us on those? Uh, yeah, I, I think in terms of the magnitude of the, the hit, it's still unknown. There, there was an assessment done by American Water Works Association more focused on the larger uh, utilities, um, and they were specifically looking at um, issues of non-payment, of reductions in demand, um, and even higher costs. They found that the biggest factor affecting sort of revenue in the bottom line was really this issue of demand. That's where they anticipated seeing the biggest impact. Um, so, you know, I, th I think it, it, it potentially is significant. I think there's still t a lot of uncertainty of how long it's going to last. Um, I don't think most of us thought it was going to last as long as it currently is. Um, uh, so I think it's lasting longer than folks had initially anticipated, but, but we're not yet out, out of the woods. Although I, you know, I will note 
Um, several, again, it's so hard to tell because we're going to, seems we're going kind of back and forth here um, in terms of uh, shelter in place and, and coming out of it. Many utilities about a month and a half ago were seeing their demand start to restabilize to get back to normal levels. Businesses were starting to reopen. Um, now, though, I suspect because the things are starting, you know, they're starting to be more shelter in place or starting to be even greater concern, we may see it go back. Um, so I think it's still too early to tell um, on that. It's something we need to be really actively monitoring. Um, and it's just so dynamic and changing every day. Uh, Great. Uh, so there, there, there's a, we're going to continue on on the financial theme. There's a couple of uh, quest, uh, questions about this. So one is federal level uh, funding for some of the water infrastructure. If you could speak a little bit about what's in play there that you might be aware of. Um, but then there's the question, a second question that's related to that, in addition to possible federal funding, what state uh, funding opportunities might there be around bond measures or otherwise here in California, I, I suspect is the sc geographic scope of that question. But related to that is the question, um, is this really just a funding issue or are going to be there are other ways to, uh, through regulatory reform or other policies that can reprioritize those investments that are necessary versus just um, public funding that comes from these other sources. So it's what's happened at the federal level? Is there stuff local or, uh, or, or state level? And then are there other solutions to deal with this uh, deferral and in, in investment besides just throwing money at it? Yeah, so there's still, I think, at the federal level, a lot of discussion about some sort of recovery and stimulus and water being a component of that. Um, I think the details of that are still being worked out. Um, there, there is the issue, which, which my colleague Morgan will talk about, around uh, related to, to non-payment, um, and that's one aspect of it. But, but the other aspect is, is related to this, the fact that you know, demand is down, revenue is down, and these uh, infrastructure investments won't be maintained. So I think there's still a conversation on that. There's still conversation of what are the types of things that will be funded, but, but I expect you know, in the next couple of months, that'll, that'll really advance and we'll have a better, uh, better line of sight on, on where that's headed. Um, I do think, though, there, there will be some funds available. Um, in terms of other funds, you know, I think uh, a lot of states are going to be strapped, frankly. Um, I don't see that, <laughs> you know, given the impacts of COVID-19 and the economic downturn, obviously the states can't print money, um, so they are much more constrained. Um, and I think even programs they had in place may be, may be dialed back. Um, so, so not as many options, I think, at, at the state level. That being said, there are programs, there are some programs that are still available. Um, revolving funds, for example, a lot of that's federal money, but it, it is kind of given out at the state level. Um, I'm cognizant of time, and we want to press forward to a, another uh, presentation. And, uh, but I will look to pick up some of these questions at the end, uh, if time allows. But before making the pivot to Morgan's presentation, there are a couple of questions around defining water resilience. Uh, what would we mean? What, what does water uh, resilient water use look like? Have we uh, engaged in the policy uh, frame to try to better define wh how, what are the types of policies that would uh, promote water resilience? Any comments on that? I will just say my own uh, uh, input into that is that, that we are in the throes of doing some of that definitional work right now and the metrics for water resilience as well. Um, but um, that's work in progress. It's not like I can point you to a product yet. But Heather, anything that you want to say about how do we define water resilience and or what we might mean by resilient water use? Yeah, no, I think it's a it's a great question. And as you know, it's one we're starting to think uh, more about. I think the other component and one of the things I'm really interested is in thinking about um, the interaction between resilience and sustainability. Um, and so there are there are many quote unquote resilience to strategies that are not sustainable. Um, and so I think what we're going to have to struggle with is how do, how do you balance both of those things? Um, and, I, and I think it can be done, but I think that needs to be a part of that conversation and understanding of what, what resilience means um, and, and how best to implement it. Great. And I will just once again plug the World Bank's work on this. I think they've done uh, quite a bit of work to try to put forward a resiliency strategy for cities, including some working definitions for the concept and term. So let's pivot a, a little bit. Um, I'm, I am cognizant of time. I want to make sure we have enough time for the, the next segment. 
So with that, um, Morgan, over to you. I think you might be driving the deck uh, and speaking. So that would make that at least a little smoother. Thank you so much. Yes. Let's see if my computer can catch up with me. Great. So hello, everyone. Thank you so much, Jason and Heather, um, for your remarks and kicking off my talk. I'm going to be talking um, about this part of water's vital importance to human health. Um, and even without a pandemic, water and sanitation are fundamental for human health. Um, however, uh, in the United States today, millions of people lack basic access to water and sanitation. And even millions more, somewhere on the order of 9 to 45 million people, we believe, uh, rely on water systems that actually violate health-based standards, which means that they can't uh, safely drink water from their tap or bathe or do other things. Um, and low-income households and communities of color have been shown to be at greatest risk of both um, living without basic access to water and sanitation, as well as to experiencing uh, unsafe water in their homes. Um, and this indicates that we need to, to really better orient our solutions to address um, these communities. One, one of the um, uh, way or one of the challenges in addressing these issues is uh, affordability and the cost of water and, and um, uh, making water affordable for everyone in, in their different economic situations. And so water affordability is very complex. Um, and for example, there's no universally agreed upon measure or metric of water affordability. Um, there's a lot of different ways different groups try to measure it. And uh, we still haven't come to an exact way. But um, so that makes it harder to really tackle and nail down and find solutions. But um, there are proxies. So one of those proxies that Pacific Institute has recently been in using and looking at is around utility shutoffs. Um, and so before diving into this topic specifically, uh, I'll just orient you to what I'm, I'm have up on the screen. So uh, some analysis that we've done recently, um, my colleagues and I looked at some data uh, from the US Department of Housing and Urban Development that does a uh, survey, a national survey uh, that is representative of the United States um, at the household level and asks a variety of questions uh, among them around utility shutoffs um, and disconnections to utility services. So one caveat here is that the survey does not uh, specify in their question whether the utility is water or energy, electricity, gas, etc. So um, the conclusions we draw here are broadly applicable to utilities and not just specific to water, but we do have some data to support that the trends you see in utility shutoffs more broadly can be applied to water specifically. Um, so on the graph, you have across the horizontal uh, axes um, income brackets. Um, from less than 10,000 per household at a household level per year up to 120,000 or more per year. And then on the uh, vertical axes, you have percent of households that either um, in light blue have received a utility shutoff notice or in dark blue have then subsequently been disconnected from a utility. And one of the main takeaways here, besides just the staggering numbers of um, shutoffs that occur and disconnection notices that are um, handed out every three months, is that um, utility shutoff notices are actually served at relatively similar levels across income brackets in our country. Um, so that, that was a really interesting finding. Um, and then Secondary to that, we saw that uh, the disconnections uh, are not equal and, and disproportionately impact lower income households. And while this is not surprising at all, um, because you would expect a lower income household to be less able to pay a water utility bill if they are having that challenge, um, it does provide evidence um, that there is a need to work on affordability at the household level. Um, that addresses these lower income households in our communities. 
Another way we looked at this data was through uh, utility shutoffs by race. So uh, this is the same data set, only here on the horizontal axis, you're looking at uh, different categories of race that households selected in this survey. And then again, on the um, vertical axis, you see the percent of households that either in light blue received a utility shutoff notice and in darker blue um, were subsequently disconnected. Uh, to their utility. And the main finding that we um, walked away with from this uh, data analysis was that compared to white households that receive shutoff notices, black households are two times more likely to be disconnected. Native American and Alaska Native households are three times more likely to be disconnected. And households with two or more races are two times more likely to be disconnected. Um, and so what, what we're really noticing here is that there is a, there's a, a racial equity component to utility shutoffs. And while these differences across racial groups um, may potentially be able to be explained by income, um, they also could be reflective of differences in utility policies in different geographies and different communities, or they could be um, reflecting inconsistency in how customer service policies are implemented for customers of different races. And so there's really just more work to be done to understand this equity and racial component of utility disconnections, which are a, again, a proxy for water affordability. And now I, I, I wanna bring it a little, the conversation a little bit back to what it means to be uh, disconnected, particularly from water um, at both the personal and communal levels. So for an individual household to be disconnected from water, I think it's pretty easy to understand what that means. But probably for most of us on this webinar, I know for myself, it's virtually impossible for me to understand what it would mean to not be able to walk to my tap and pour myself a glass of water. And it's very difficult for me to imagine what it would mean for me not to be able to use my toilet when I need to use my toilet. Um, these are things that someone in a household that is dis disconnected even for a few hours has to struggle with and overcome. Um, and then how that plays into the community and affects the community that they live in. Um, uh, it's, <clears throat> it's clear and, and understandable that an uh, individual household that's unable to wash and sanitize um, within their home adequately would then therefore be at higher risk of contracting diseases. And when they were, are required to interact with other community members, such as grocery shopping or in school or other places like that, it's understandable how then this household could potentially impact the community's overall health. And this is where we really get back to how water access is a resilience issue. Because if you have individuals and in, in households in your community that don't have access to water, your community during a global pandemic particularly, but even during normal times is gonna be less resilient to disease and other contractable things that can be um, affected and improved when you have access to water. So if to further connect it to what we're seeing today um, and, and back to the COVID-19 pandemic, here I'm showing a map of the United States um, and these are the reported cases of COVID-19. This is images directly taken from the CDC website yesterday. Um, so uh, pretty up-to-date data. And so as, as cases of COVID-19 continue to rise across the country, we need to do what we can to protect individual household um, health and thereby protecting our community's health. Um, by preventing households from losing their access to water. And so utilities and states have already been doing this during the pandemic. Many um, uh, did take steps at initially to put moratoriums on utility disconnections and water, um, specifically on water utility dis disconnections. Um, unfortunately, as, a, as this latest data that I could find, um, only 10 states in the District of Columbia currently have effective moratoriums on utility disconnections in place today. And only a tw 22 other states have partial restrictions um, on disconnections or discourage utility disconnections. Um, so this doesn't cover everyone. These, these are not um, effectively covering everyone. And there are other utilities that aren't in this count that do have their own moratoriums. Um, 
but even among those, uh, there's all of the people who were disconnected from water and weren't able to access water prior to the pandemic who aren't being reconnected. There's a handful that of utilities that are reconnecting customers, and that is a a great thing to hear that it is possible and utilities are doing it, but it's happening on far too small a scale. So I'll, I'll just um, wrap up my talk in a similar vein as Heather did with some recommendations. And, and really the top line um, recommendation is that there is action that's uh, urgently needed to improve water access, equity, and affordability that can help us um, in addressing our current situation and then in the longer term. Um, with the challenges on these issues to build more resilience. My first recommendation is around prohibiting water shutoffs and reconnecting previously disconnected households. Um, I just stated this, but it, it is urgently needed and it can be done today by um, parties such as utility leaders as, as well as state leadership. Uh, secondly, uh, Utilities really need to and should expand customer assistance programs and provide debt management plans. Um, as Heather pointed out, with the severe economic impacts of this pandemic, um, it's, it's greatly, uh, it's causing a lot of people to not be able to pay their bills even more so than before the pandemic. And therefore, these customer assistance programs need to grow to meet this, this need. Um, and as moratoriums on water shutoffs lift, people still there'll still be people without jobs and debt management plans can go a long way in alleviating some of that immediate stress of of and burden of a of an extremely large bill landing on a household's plate um, when these moratoriums lift and then finally um, in line with also what heather was saying there needs to be appropriate federal funds to offset customer as assistance expenses utilities cannot be expected to meet the um, expansive need of uh, their all of their customers, especially small and middle sized utilities or utilities who already were struggling to keep up with the, the, the need in their customer base for more assistance and with water affordability. Um, and federal funds can fill that gap and should fill that gap. And so we, we definitely are hopeful um, and doing what we can to uh, support and advocate for the federal stimulus packages to include a, uh, a, a, a part that goes to water utilities that are helping their customers with um, through customer assistance programs. So with that, I'm gonna send it back to Jason to um, finish up and, and take us through our other questions. Thank you, Morgan. Uh, so uh, I should have made uh, this clear before, but these links that uh, are uh, at the end of these Q&A uh, uh, slides are where you can find uh, issue briefs that unpack this topic in more detail. Uh, they're pretty easy to find uh, thanks to Google. Um, they're uh, on our um, a link is on our main website as well. Um, and so we, we encourage you uh, to um, download those papers and, and review them. But maybe I'll use that also as a segue for the first question. And, and, and it's actually, um, it, they came in early with um, Heather's presentation as well. And it's around data and where data are available, whether it be on shutoffs uh, or on uh, these changes in water use at the municipal level, residential and otherwise. Uh, could either of you speak to where uh, some of this data could be found on the Institute site or otherwise uh, where these resources may be um, able to be tracked down and what, what parts of it are, are available to the public? Either yeah, you... I, yep, I, I can jump in. I'll let Morgan, maybe I'll let you talk about the shutoff data in California and elsewhere and maybe I'll, I'll talk about the demand data. Uh, there are, let's see, in, in terms of what we were able to pull out, um, it was really through through desktop research and also reaching out to individual utilities to, to get information about impacts on demand. So there's really no sort of centralized place to get that information in most places. Um, however, in California, uh, we do have requirements that water utilities report monthly 
water use uh, and population uh, to the State Water Resources Control Board. Um, they're the, the primary water regulatory agency in, in the state. Um, and so there is, and it's, it's the large supplier, so there's 400 plus utilities that are reporting on a monthly basis or thereabouts. Um, and so there is information that can be pulled from that. Um, and we have been looking at that and, and reviewing it. Um, uh, so, so there is some data available. I suspect in individual states there will eventually be data available, but I don't think anybody's doing other such real-time sort of updates. Um, so, it's, so it's pretty spotty um, in, terms, in terms of the impact. Morgan, you want to talk a bit about the shutoff? Yeah, um, I mean, similar. So there's the, the, the shutoff data that I was referencing can be accessed and publicly downloaded on uh, the, the U.S. Um, Department of Housing website. Um, and we're in our issue brief, we actually do provide a, the specific link to where we got that data. Um, and the survey we, we took data from is actually done, uh, I believe it's every two or three years. So uh, it'll be updated pretty regularly or fairly regularly. The um, other utility shutoff data that we've come across is more uh, also in California where there's an electronic annual reporting requirement that now very recently has started to ask water utilities to report on water shutoffs. Um, there's a lot of issues with uh, the data set um, just on inconsistencies with reporting and, and, you know, there needs to be some work, but that's one start. And we have done a little bit of analysis of that data set as well and actually looked, it mirrored quite well what we found with the national shutoff data. Great. Um, I encourage folks to submit uh, questions through the Q&A function. We'll probably have time to take a, a number of them. Uh, in the meantime, there's a, a, a couple of questions that are California focused and are, are referring to Prop 218 and some of the constraints uh, that, that that proposition plays on rates uh, and rate structures that um, could address some of these social equity issues and uh, the question around um, whether um, uh, uh, you know there will be changes uh, to California uh, uh, law that would allow um, subsistence rates uh, for low-income communities. Um, so I, I'm not sure which of you want to try to uh, take on that answer, but I would encourage you to talk a little bit about for those that this is somewhat of a technical question and for those not steeped in what uh, these restrictions that uh, 218 has placed might benefit from a little bit of an explanation of, of uh, what this issue is about and any thoughts you might have about uh, uh, how, how this could be amended as we go forward to address this issue of social equity. Yeah, so um, Maury, maybe I'll do a little bit of background on kind of what it is in California. And I know you've looked at a similar issue sort of national. And so maybe you can talk about that there. Um, so Prop 218 was a, a voter initiative that was passed in the 1990s. Um, and essentially what it tried to do was to create, uh, it, they were trying to avoid water rates being used for other purposes, say within a municipality. Um, and, and so the idea was that water rates needed to be used for water related costs and expenses. Um, that was the, the big picture. Um, the way it's been interpreted over the years, there's been a number of court cases on it, it is essentially prevents any customer cross subsidization. So, you know, what you pay for water as a, as a customer should reflect what it costs to provide it. Um, that sounds like a logical thing, but where it starts to break down is when you have customers that are unable to afford water and you want to do cross subsidies um, to support them to provide uh, affordability programs, for example, reduced rates, et cetera, you're not able to do that under Prop 218. Um, and so that has been a barrier for using water customer revenue, water rate revenue for those types of purposes. And one of the reasons uh, utilities have not, don't have as many of those programs available. Now, there are utilities sometimes have other revenue sources they can use for those types of programs, um, but not all utilities have those. And it certainly has um, been a barrier in California. There have been efforts over the years to try to address this. Um, some see it as an unintended consequence. It was not sort of the, the vision of, of the folks that, that really advanced this. Um, but those have yet to be successful. 
Um, and so it, that is a problem uh, and, and, a, and a major one that, that we need to, to overcome. Um, it's not unique though to California. And so maybe I'll, I'll hand it off to Morgan and you can talk maybe about the sort of more national context. Yeah, um, not our work, uh, another organization's work. And now of course I'm blanking on the name, but again, it's in the issue brief. We cite this a report from a few years ago, very, uh, not too long ago, did an analysis state by state of um, impediments to cut of customer assistance funding um, for, by, for water utilities. And it found that what, what's happened in um, California with this proposition isn't unique. Uh, there are several other states that have laws on the books that prevent water utilities from what she's saying, cross subsidizing, taking, you know, my water bill that I pay and taking a portion of it to cover the cost of another customer who can't afford to pay it. Um, and so uh, that's not unique, but there are a lot of states where it is legal. Um, however, the actually one of the main findings from this other report was that um, there's actually a lot of ambiguity in most states around whether or not a, a utility can cross subsidize to for customer assistance programs. And so there's in most, uh, in many, many places, utilities are actually just legally unclear and therefore have not taken steps to um, build customer assistance programs that could then in court be shut down. Um, so a lot of work, one of our main recommendations coming from the issue brief on ensuring water access was that, um, uh, work needs to be done to uh, clarify these legal ambiguities in states like California, where there's actually, you know, well, California, you could argue is a legal ambiguity as well, but in states where it's been in sort of in gone through court already and, and municipalities or utilities aren't able to cross subsidize for customer assistance programs, there needs to be new um, legislation that directly addresses this. And in California, there are some efforts at least around creating um, pots of money that can and that can be uh, dispersed across the state and help with affordability issues for water. And then the last thing I'll say is that in the immediate term, I've also found we found examples of states like the state of Washington, where there are legal impediments to cross subsidizing for customer assistance programs, where the actually the governor has been able to suspend those rules so that right now during the pandemic, utilities can take some of their funds from their revenue and apply it to customer assistance programs. So even in this, even in places where it is ambiguous or illegal, um, there are leaders who can take action and, and put those impediment and move impediments to make it uh, possible to do so. Great. Thank you for looking forward about uh, what some of the workarounds are as well then as in addition to just summarizing the issues. We are at the top of the hour. I'd like to ask uh, for the last slide. We aren't able to get to all of the questions that were in the queue. Although I will note that a number of the questions that uh, were raised in the queue, I believe are tackled in one or more of the issue briefs. So we would encourage you uh, to uh, visit the Pacific Institute's website and uh, to uh, take a look uh, at a little bit more uh, extensive uh, analyses of the things that we talked about today, including some of the data sources that were mentioned. Uh, I also want to uh, acknowledge and uh, thank uh, the, the wide range of colleagues that participated in the development of this work that Heather and Morgan presented. They're listed here, uh, and in some cases, uh, with Greg's uh, case, uh, partnership with UCLA. The rest here are Pacific Institute staff. Um, I mentioned at the outset that we will be doing more of these uh, webinars um, that are oriented toward uh, a, a general interest audience. I think um, the logic behind that is the sense that um, while much of the work that the Institute does, does is technical in nature, they are, uh, they are of interest to the general public and we are confident we can package that information in a way that's not overly technical uh, and that uh, can address uh, an issue that's a salient uh, for people that care about water and water sustainability. So if you are not already subscribed to the Pacific Institute's listserv, uh, it's very easy to do. 
and uh, encourage you to go to the Pacific Institute's website and sign up, and that will be the place uh, where we'll be able to uh, notify you of uh, future such webinars. So thank you all for joining today. Uh, we will be circulating this presentation for those that have registered, uh, and we also have a recording uh, of it, and we can uh, circulate, we'll circulate that link as well in case you would like to share it with uh, friends or colleagues that would have an interest in this topic. So thank you very much. Uh, thank you to Heather uh, and Morgan for your uh, presentations today and look forward to seeing you all in our next webinar.